Anatomy and Physiology, Chapter 5, The Integumentary System. Integument is another word for skin. So the main student learning objectives in this chapter uh, is we'll study the different components of skin, uh, the epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis. We'll study the structure and function of each one of these different layers of the skin. We'll talk about the different glands that are found in the skin and the secretions. We'll also study the um, accessory structures that are found in the skin, like nail and hair. We'll also study how the skin can heal itself when there's an injury. So our skin is the largest organ in the human body. Here, this, there's a picture of a man. It can be up to 16% of the human body. The accessory structures that are found in the skin are hair, nails, and glands. So if you stretch out the skin, it, it can be up to 1.2 millimeters uh, meter square. So the skin has two parts, the cutaneous membrane, which is the skin, and accessory structures, which are hair, nail, and glands. Let's look at the important functions of the skin. Skin is the barrier between the human body and the external environment. So the first main uh, function would be protection. And then of course, uh, for maintaining homeostasis for thermoregulation. So it's protecting all the underlying tissues and organs. It's protecting us from infection. So it's the first line of defense against the bacteria and virus and all the harmful environmental hazards, protects us from desiccation, uh, abrasion, chemical assault, and radiation. Our skin is also a excretory organ because it will get rid of uh, uh, toxic salts, water, organic waste through uh, the glands and the skin. It plays a huge role in maintaining our body temperature, thereby insulating our body. It also makes melanin that will protect us from UV light. Keratin will provide a waterproofing and it can make vitamin D3. The adipose tissue in the skin is a place for storing lipids, so it can be a source of energy. We perceive our environment through our skin, so we are able to detect touch, pressure, pain, and temperature because we have the receptors for it in the skin. There are three main uh, layers in the skin. So here's a cross section of the skin. So you can see the epidermis followed by the dermis and then the hypodermis. And each of these layers in turn, like epidermis is made up of several layers. The dermis is made up of papillary layer and the reticular layer and the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. You can see it is low, uh, you can see a lot of fat and large uh, vessels here. So you can see in the dermis between the epidermis, you can see the hair follicle. So here you can see a hair follicle. You can see a sweat gland. So the epidermis is made up of epithelial skin and the dermis is connective tissue. So let's label some of the structures that are found in the skin. So superficially, you can see some hair. You can see the pore of the sweat gland. And then you can trace that into a duct and then a coiled up uh, sweat gland. In the junction of the epidermis and dermis, you can see some tactile corpuscle. They are touch receptors, light touch receptors. You can see a hair shaft, a hair follicle that is associated with the sebaceous gland. You can see a muscle that is attached to the gland. It's called erectopili muscle. 
they have follicle and then there is a, a nerve fiber that will uh, feed the hair follicle. There's another sweat gland here and then we can see a lot of adipose tissue in the hypodermis. And you can see how the connective tissue is richly um, vascularized. You can see the arteries, so thick, dense arteries in the hypodermis and then it gets finer and finer. So it, it um, offers all the nutrients and oxygen and then you can see it come back as a, a vein. So here, this is a picture of the epidermis. So there are two types of epidermis. Certain parts of the skin in our body are very thin. It's mostly thin skin, but you see thick skin in your uh, palms, in your soles. Um, so th they have an extra layer, the thick skin. So the epidermis is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, the irregular shaped cells. It is avascular. So it will sit on a basement membrane, here, basement membrane and all the nutrients are going to diffuse from the uh, vascularized dermis. So all the nutrients are go going to diffuse from the dermis up to the uh, epidermis. The predominant cell type is called keratinocytes. They're called so because they are very rich in keratin, which is a waterproofing protein. It is a fibrous protein that's found in your hair, your nails. It also offers the toughness in your skin and it has water resistant properties. So the epidermis sits on the basement membrane, which sits on a, the dermis, which is the uh, connective tissue. There are two types of skin, thin skin, which covers most of the body and it has only four layers of keratinocytes and thick skin, which is found in the palms and soles and it has an extra layer. The different layers of the epidermis. So here is a micro photograph. So you can see the, uh, the first bottom most layer that is sitting on the basement membrane is called stratum basal. Uh, it's highly mitotic. This is where cells are dividing very fast. The next layer is stratum spinosum. It has a spiny appearance, hence the name. Stratum granulosum has a lot of granules of uh, keratin and keratinohyalin mo uh, molecules, so the name. Stratum lucidum is found only in thick skin of your soles and your palm. It has a glassy appearance. And then the stratum corneum. So what's the, the big picture is the cells of stratum basal are undergoing mitotic divisions very quickly. And as those cells divide, they're going to push up. So in a period of 15 to 30 days, the cells will move from stratum basal to stratum corneum. So you get a, a fresh new layer of skin every 30 days, 15 to 30 days. Stratum basal is also called stratum germinativum. So here in this bottommost layer, you can see that the cells are undergoing mitosis and dividing very fast, and they are connected to the basement membrane by hemidesmosomes. And they have a rich pattern, and then this will fit into the dermal papilla of uh, the dermis, which is responsible for your uh, fingerprints. Also in the stratum basal, we have a light touch receptors called Merkel cells, which is a modified nerve ending. And this is where you find the melanocytes, which uh, the, contain the pigment melanin, which will uh, protect the skin and us from UV radiation. The epidermal ridges that are responsible for fingerprints, you can, it also has a lot of sweat pores uh, that's why when like somebody leaves, a when they are sweaty, they will leave a mark of their uh, fingerprint on uh, hard surfaces. And it is genetically determined, you know, the, the 
the pattern is genetically determined, but the epidermal ridges uh, play a huge role in uh, providing friction to the finger trips so that uh, you have a good grip when you're holding things. Stratum uh, spinosum or the spiny layer is the next layer. So there's about eight to 10 layers of keratinocytes which are attached together with the desmosomes. And the cells as they move up are slowly dehydrating. So the cytoplasm is shrinking and the cytoskeleton is jutting out and then giving it a spiny or prickly appearance. So the cells are continuing to divide here and then it's slowly pushed up to the stratum granulosum level. One common uh, phagocytotic cell that can be found in this region are called Langerhan cells, which can engulf uh, a bacteria or any foreign debris of uh, damaged cells. It's phagocytotic. It's, it found, it's found in stratum spinosum. Stratum granulosum is the next layer on top of it. So the cells have stopped dividing. The cells are flatter and the membranes are beginning to thicken but they are generating a lot of keratin and keratinohyalin, which is a cross-linked version of the protein keratin. And it has a grainy appearance when you look at it in the microscope. So here the cells have dehydrated. The nuclei and all the cell organelles would have broken up and the cell is almost dying. It's dying, leaving behind a lot of keratin. That will then lead to stratum lucidum. So lucidum is found only in thick skin. And then it, it forms the basis of lucidum in thick skin or accessory structures of hair and nails. And then that also, uh, it forms um, stratum corneum in thin skin. So in thick skin, there is an extra layer called stratum lucidum. It is very smooth and translucent layer. It offers a lot of physical protection. Here, the keratinocytes are dead. They are flat and they are packed up with a modified form of keratohyalin called elidin. It is a clear protein. So it, it is a very good barrier for water. The next topmost layer is the stratum corneum or the horn layer. There's about 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells, which are water resistant and they are shed and replaced every two weeks. The way we lose water from our skin is called perspiration. Insensible perspiration is the interstitial fluid loss by evaporation and we can lose up to half a liter of water every day. And the water loss through uh, sweat glands is called sensible perspiration. because of three main uh, chemicals here. The first one is carotene, which is an orange yellow pigment that can accumulate in the epidermal cells. And it can be converted to vitamin A. Melanin is a yellow red or brown to black pigment that is produced by melanocytes. It is stored, the melanin pigment will be stored in transport vesicles called melanosomes, and then it is transferred to the keratinocytes. So here you can see a melanocyte. The number of melanocytes is the same on, uh, between all human beings, but it is the melanin production that uh, alters. So the gene expression is different. So you can see how the melanin pigment is packaged in vesicles called melanosomes and they migrate to the keratinocytes and they kind of form a hood uh, above the nucleus protecting the DNA from mutations. So here's dark skin, it is full of melanin and here there's light skin, uh, there's not much melanin, giving the skin a pale color. Another uh, attribute for skin color is blood circulation. So when the red blood cells are oxygenated and uh, uh, on a hot day, your blood vessels will dilate and giving the skin a red hue. 
uh, cyanosis is when there's, there's a lack of oxygen in the blood and then it can give a bluish tint. And this can happen in uh, disease conditions or when it's very cold. So here there's some pictures of uh, uh, carcinoma, skin cancer. So if it happens in the basal layer, it's called basal skin carcinoma. The squamous cell carcinoma, and then the melanocytes uh, are becoming malignant. It's called melanoma. So there are many, uh, you know, uh, illness of the skin. Here's jaundice. So this happens when there's a malfunction of. Uh, in the liver, there's a buildup of bile and the skin is yellowish. Uh, uh, President uh, John F. Kennedy uh, is known to have suffered from Addison's disease, which is uh, a pituitary disorder. There's an excess of uh, melano melanocyte stimulating hormone and uh, there's uh, bronzing happening in the skin uh, or vitiligo where there's lack of melanization in the skin or albinism, which is genetic. Again, uh, lack of uh, melanization in the skin. One of the important uh, functions of our skin is that in the presence of uh, sunlight, it can make vitamin D3. The scientific name is uh, Chloe calciferol. So the liver and the kidneys will then convert this to calcitriol, which will aid in the absorption of calcium and phosphorus in the small intestine of our body. When there's a deficiency of vitamin three, you know, the bones kind of buckle, uh, like a, a bow leg kind, um, and it can cause to rickets. Dermis is the next layer found under the epidermis. So the epidermis is here. Epi means on top of, epi, on top of the dermis. And then there's this very big dermal layer. That in turn will be uh, divided into two layers, but you can see how the, the papilla, the dermal papilla, the projections of the dermis will fit into the epidermal ridges like a puzzle piece, thereby keeping the epidermis in place. So it's located between the epidermis and the subcutaneous layer, and it is very, very full of different structures. It contains blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves. It is going to anchor the epidermis in place and all the sweat glands and hair follicles, they all will originate in the dermis. The two main layers are the papillary layer where you can see the papilla. Papilla means uh, a nipple shaped projection. So the papillary layer is made up of areolar connective tissue. And you can see the capillaries here are very fine. And it does have a little bit of uh, um, a nerve endings. Like you can see a mycinocarpacil, which is a light touch receptor. The reticular layer is very, very tough and strong. It is full of dense, irregular connective tissue and large blood vessels and nerves. Uh, some interesting points here is when they do tattoo, if the tattoo is just in the epidermis, you know, you lose the tattoo because you get a fresh skin every 30 days. So when they are injecting the ink, they go down deeper into the dermis so that it's permanent. And that's why it hurts because there's lots of nerves here. So it's a picture of how uh, tattooing is done. And here is a picture of how as you age, because of hormonal... Uh, uh, influences, we, we lose the, the reticular layer, the elastic uh, fibers and the collagen fibers. And that's the reason. So when the foundation is damaged, the epidermis will kind of dip forming wrinkles. This is a picture of uh, something called cleavage lines. So these fibers that we are talking about they are not random. They, they follow a pattern in different parts of the body. So here you can see in the thoracic region, they're going like east, west like that. And then they're going at an angle in the abdominal region. So these cleavage lines or tension lines are because of collagen and elastic fibers that are arranged in bundles, parallel bundles forming a pattern. 
Now, why is this important to know? Um, surgeons have to know this because if you make a cut along, along the grain, it heals faster and there's less scarring. Whereas if you cut it across the grain, then it takes longer to heal and the incision might not close. So it is surgeons know that they should, when they cut or make an incision, they go along the grain. Blood supply to the um, integument. So you can see heavy, heavy, thick arteries and veins are found in the hypodermis. And then it gets finer and finer as it comes up. See, that's why deeper the cut, more the bleeding. So you can see a papillary plexus and you can see a reticular plexus. Plexus means a whole bunch of them together. So the epidermis is avascular. There's no blood supply and all the nutrients has to diffuse from the dermis. So right here in the papillary layer, we have a papillary plexus. In the cutaneous layer, we have an, a cutaneous plexus. And then after the arteries deliver all the nutrients and they return back as a vein, it is called as a venous uh, plexus. When there is a blow, uh, uh, somebody, you know, if you, if you bump into something very, uh, with, uh, with a lot of force, or there's somebody gives you a punch, like here, uh, the blood vessels are damaged, resulting in bruising. The scientific name for that is called contusion. Contusion, the blue black bruising, uh, uh, a telltale sign of uh, domestic abuse. So our skin, apart from prote protecting, making us vitamin D, are helping, is helping us to perceive the environment. See, when the wind blows, we know it. It's because our skin is studded with receptors. Receptors that are closer to the epidermis, they are called light touch receptors, tactile touch receptors. Examples are mycinocarpacil, Merkel cells. So they are all uh, modified nerve endings that can help you perceive the environment. Deep down, there is this uh, uh, cop a laminated carpacil called Pacinian carpacil. So they're all named after the scientist who discovered it. There's an organ of Ruffini. And then they are deep pressure and vibration uh, receptors. So the, the nerve fibers in the skin are going to control the blood flow in the skin and also all the glandular secretions. So they are sensory in function and they have control and regulation functions. Hypodermis is the bottommost layer. And this is where, you know, you get your injections. You know, that's why it's called hypodermal injection. It is also called as the subcutaneous layer or superficial fascia. And it is loaded with adipocytes. And you can see a lot of thick arteries and veins here. So the cutaneous plexus can be found here. So it is lying under the integument and it will stabilize the skin. It is made up of elastic areolar and adipose tissue. It is connected to the reticular tissue above with fibers. The hypodermis is vascular. It has a function of insulation and cushioning and it's a site of uh, hypodermic need injections. So, you know, like when you lose weight, you know, you look very skinny, your face is smaller, is because we lose this fat here under the skin. So there are three main accessory structures in the skin, hair, nails, and glands. So here, you see hair is found all over the body, except you know, your soles and your, your palms or the side of your digits, side of your toes, lips and external genitalia. The main function of hair, it, it protects, it insulates, it guards openings against particles and insects. It has a sensory function and thermoregulation function. So let's look at the parts of the hair. You, the, so the follicle is found deep in the dermis and it is wrapped with dense connective tissue sheath. 
And here, there's a whole bunch of sensory nerves here, a hair plexus, nerve plexus as well. That's why when you pull out a hair, it hurts. There is a nerve here. The hair root is the lower part of the hair. The upper part of the hair is the hair shaft. The muscle that is attached to the hair is called a rectus pili muscle. It is an involuntary muscle. Uh, so, you know, when you are too cold or you're afraid, it can contract and then make the hair to stand up on its straight, causing goosebumps. There is a sebaceous gland that secretes a sebaceous, like a, a protein rich lipid that will coat the hair, protecting it and keeping bacteria out. So here, uh, the, it's a cross-section of the hair at the junction. So you can, if you take the hair shaft, the, it has a central core called medulla. It is made up of soft keratin. Then there is a layer of ha hard keratin that is called cortex. Then comes the cuticle. So the cuticle is like a, a little shaggy and then it will have a, a hard keratin. And then here's the different layers of the follicle. And then you can see the connective tissue protecting uh, the follicle. So hair itself is dead. So the keratin will be made by the uh, follicle that is alive and it's enriched with arteries and veins. It will make the keratinized hair protein and it will squeeze it out like toothpaste coming out of a toothpaste tube. So the keratin will come out, the shaft will come out. The shaft is dead, the hair follicle is living. Here's some of the important glands that are found in our skin. Here's a sebaceous gland associated with a hair. So it is simple, it can be simple or it can be branched with many lobules. They will discharge the sebaceous uh, secretion directly into the skin surface. So this see, uh, sebaceous uh, secretion will protect the hair and also keep bacteria out. Coming to sweat glands, there's two. Here's a apocrine sweat, uh, apocrine sweat gland are found in your armpits and your nipples and groin area. And these are the stinky uh, glands. They will secrete products. Uh, here's an apocrine. They will secrete products into the hair follicle they are sticky and cloudy, and they are responsible for causing body odors when bacteria breaks it down. Merocrine sweat glands, here's a merocrine sweat gland. They are found everywhere in the body, and there's a lot in your uh, palms and uh, sole of your feet. There's a coil tube, and then it excretes its uh, exudate through a duct. That's eccrine or merocrine sweat gland. Nail is an accessory structure of the integument. So the nails are protecting your fingertips and your toes. And it is made up of a uh, dead packed keratin. So the nail production actually happens deep uh, within the epidermal fold near the bone. So you here in this picture, you can see the bone or the phalanges. So where the nail emerges from is called as the nail root. And the part of the nail that you can see is the nail body. The half moon that you see on the nail is called the lanula. It is a crest at the base of the nail. So the nail, the sides of the nail, they lie in lateral grooves. Uh, it's called as a nail fold, a proximal and lateral nail folds. The skin under the nail is called hyponychium, in the, the, where the, the free edge of the nail is, hyponychium. The, the, the cuticle where you can see the nail is emerging is that part is called hyp, uh, ep, eponychium. So this is the tip of the proximal nail fold, eponychium. Hyponychium is where the free end is. So when there is a, when you hurt yourself, let's say you get a cut. So it looks like there's a cut that goes deep down into the, subcutaneous layer in the hypodermis. So how does our body heal itself? 
any time there's a cut and the arteries are nicked or cut, there is a bleeding. So uh, the first thing that will happen is blood clotting will happen. So when there is a cut like this, there's bleeding ha happening, the first cell to wake up is mast cell. And the mast cells are going to trigger the inflammation reaction. In a few hours, a blood clot is formed and it is sealed off this area forming a scab. The cells in stratum basal, remember this is where we find the fastly dividing mitotic cells. So they are going to migrate along the periphery of the cut, sealing it. Phagocytotic cells, they will uh, wake up and they are activated and they are going to phagocytize the debris and the bacteria and the virus that might have entered the wound. As time passes, like a week after the injury, as the epidermal cells migrate and they seal off, it will push out the uh, scab. And the fibroblast will lay down collagen fibers here remodeling the cut. And as the collagen fibers are forming, it will push out the scab, forming a, a scar tissue. And then over a period of time, it will still keep on remodeling. You might see a small depression. If the cut was very deep, then you might have a scar for a very, very long time. But the fibroblasts are constantly laying down collagen fibers, trying to fix the cut. So this is how our skin repairs itself when you get a, a cut. So what have we learned in this chapter? We studied the anatomy and physiology of integument or skin. We saw how the skin uh, is uh, playing a huge role in maintaining homeostasis in our body by protecting our body, cushioning our body, insulating our body against the environment. We saw the three different layers of skin, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. There are four or five layers of keratinocytes in the epidermis. And we saw what is found in each layer. We moved on. So epidermis is stratified squamous epithelium. We moved on to dermis, which is very big region. And then it has two layers also, mainly made of connective tissue. This is where we see all the collagen and elastic fibers. And we see all the arteries, veins, and uh, nerves. And we saw this is where the hair will originate from. One main thing to note is uh, changes in the appearance of the skin is a very good diagnostic tool to diagnose disorders. And uh, we saw the basic structure and function of hair and nails. And then we saw how the skin can heal itself after an injury. And I hope that helps.